You're listening to the Velo News Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. Welcome to the Velo News Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar, the third of the Velo News Podcast. I'm with the dream team of Matt Bowden. Hello, thanks for having me. And Andy Hood. Good evening, fellas. Thanks for having us back. Also Lionel Burney. Evening, Richard. And... He's been begging to be part of this podcast for two weeks now. Daniel Freib. Hi, chaps. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, Daniel. Now, um, let's, let's start with uh, Matt telling, telling the listeners where we are. Where are we, Matt? We're in the lovely medieval city of Carcassonne, France. Any, any, anything more than that? I can't help but feel put on the spot here, seeing as how I just asked the history, Richard Moore, and your response was, it's very, very old. It's very old and very beautiful, <laughs> isn't it? It's very beautiful. We're in a bar... Uh, on a sort of terrace of a bar, right up in the heart of the of the old town, uh, Richard Veronk was was walking past a minute ago. Well, actually, he stopped in the bar and was photographed by lo- lots of people. Um, a real a real popular attraction here in Carcassonne, in this beautiful medieval city. Richard Veronk is the main attraction. Now, Lionel, you've got a question for our American friends here to kick off tonight's podcast. I have indeed. Um, as we record this, the second rest day is finished. The race resumes with the Pyrenees. TJ Van Garderen, uh, very highly placed overall, fifth place. How excited are you guys about having the, potentially the first American on the podium since Greg LeMond? <laughs> I think uh, I think TJ is uh, garnering. Uh, he's garnering a lot of excitement back I in the states. I think a joke. I think Kevin's joke. <laughs> anyway, go on, Andy. No, I think I think that it's, it is a uh, you know it's it's the new generation of Americans coming up and and you know, TJ is every year taking new steps and bigger steps to get to this point and uh, he's the team captain, you know, uh, Cadell Evans raced the Giro and he's had a pretty bumpy ride and he's come through the other end in, in good position. He, four crashes, he's been on antibiotics, he's really poised for the podium and uh, personally I think he's going to finish second on this tour. What a professional answer that was, Matt. You know, I think. Uh What's good for the goose is certainly good for the gander. If uh, if he does a good ride, I mean, the Americans, they love to read about it. Um, personally, you know, we cover whatever the story is, you know, whoever that may be. Um, and so for TJ, it's, you know, is there a bit of nationalistic tendency? Sure. I mean, I think, I think it would be remiss to pretend that there wouldn't be. But, you know, I don't... Somebody asked me who my favorite rider was a couple weeks ago, and, and I, I just stood there sort of for a minute, and, and I... I didn't actually have an answer because, to, to me, I just I, I sort of look at the whole sport and I don't necessarily have favorites, and that's that's probably a really good thing. Probably a good time to pause here. the The bidons of beer, the bidons of beer, are being uh, delivered to our table. Um, right. Much needed refreshment for our mini peloton here. A bit, bit, bit delayed because there was such a huge fuss over Richard Veronk in the in the bar, but they're <laughs> but they're here now. What was that, Daniels? Oh, <laughs> That's a Richard Veronk uh, impersonation there for those not familiar. It, it is ama- It is amazing though, isn't it, lads? That um, that no American has finished on the podium in thirty four years. I see. I see what you're trying to do here. I know. No, I, tw- I, twenty-four. I, twenty-four. Uh, sorry. I, I know the road you're trying to go down. I, it's like I, I think, you know, while while we can agree cheers. that that may cheers. 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 While we cheers. Can, <laughs> Do they more important than that? While that may be a tech, I had to take a sip of beer before I gave this answer. That's an absolute technicality, right? I mean, because we're trying to pretend that a certain somebody named Lance Armstrong didn't win seven tours in a row. Um, now uh, I'm not going to go say he won those tours outright. Um, that's not really what I can do, but what I can say is, I mean, what, what everyone always says, uh, you want him on the road, and, you know, I think that if people were asked to recall who won those tours, they would still say Lance Armstrong, so. Now, we got in trouble last week for not mentioning the other American riders in the race. There are more than just, uh, as it was last week, TJ Van Garden and Andrew Talansky. Talansky, of course, no longer in the race. Um, but we were at the BMC press conference today and uh, we spoke to TJ Van Garderen, also spoke to Peter Stetna, one of his uh, main allies in the mountains. And i play here an interview. Uh, I was there with Andy Hood. Um, here is Peter Stetna. It's, it's good. It's a good experience. It's tough, though. Um, until the first rest day, the first 10 days were... It was hard to have fun, actually. It was just so stressful and crashes and the weather and the rain and the wind and the... And even the fans in Britain, like, they actually were deciding the race more than the racers. And uh, it was... I was really glad to get through that. And uh, I just tried to stay as safe as possible. I was at the back trying to just uh, 
not get caught up in a lot of the crashes and the mayhem and sometimes that's good because you stay safe but sometimes it's bad because you uh you have to ride a bit harder back there out of the corners and stuff and uh but uh knock on wood i haven't i've kept all my skin on so far and uh i uh got over a cold in that first week as well and then uh um yeah and then we got to the alps and things started to go more my way and i was able to to help tj in the mountains and looking to do that again in the Pyrenees. Is there more responsibility for you now that Atapuma's out of the race? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, uh, Darwin was a key player in the mountains. Along me and Darwin were supposed to be the guys uh, wait, uh, with DJ till the till the finale. And uh, now that Darwin's out, um, it's uh, a bit more responsibility on my shoulders. I got to be a lot more consistent for sure. And uh, but we also have uh, Peter Villetson on El Moynard, and they, uh, they've they all stepped up as well. And even Mickey Shar, you see he's climbing in the front group the other day. What's the ambiance at the dinner table now? I mean, TJ is riding very well positioned into the Pyrenees. Um, it's really good. It's it's really the same as when the race started. You know, there's there's still, when the race starts, there's there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of motivation, and, and nothing bad has happened to lose that. So uh, we're keeping it light. We're having fun at the dinner table and, you know, just general smack talk and nothing really bike racing related. And, um, yeah, we're all, we're all uh, ready for the task at hand and we, uh, we can actually see it becoming a possibility. Mm -hmm. so. Is that how you kind of decompress from the pressure of the tour a little bit, just the stresses that come with this race? Is talk about other things at the dinner yeah programs. yeah yeah we talk about funny or odd or crazy things that happen during the day and uh other yeah just normal talk normal life and uh and then i try to switch off the cell phone a little early in the night and just watch a movie or read a book or something just get unconnected so and going into the pyrenees uh the team plan obviously is to uh stay close to the, the French climbers and, and uh, keep those putting hopes alive, yeah? Yeah, um, I mean, everyone's uh, looking at TJ to, to pull out a good final time trial, but I mean, he's climbing with those guys anyway. I mean, if he can, if there's even the chance to take time, I'm sure we'll, we'll do it. And, uh, and like yesterday, you saw almost, you never know with this wind and maybe stage 19 and something happens. Um, the weather's so, uh, it's it's swirling and it's it's ever changing out here, so it's uh, that's that's a big factor right now. But yeah, and uh, for me, I wanna try to keep with TJ and uh, help him uh, keep the, those French climbers in check in Valverde until until stage 20 for him. What's been the biggest surprise on those big climbs in the Alps so far, just to, in terms of compared to other races you've done? Um. The climbs aren't any. I mean, it's uh, the field's a lot deeper. Everyone's on their best form. So, in some races, when there'll only be ten guys left, now there's forty guys left over the top of a pass. Even though you're all going max, it's uh, it really is uh, hundreds of a percentage between guys actually getting dropped and not getting dropped. So you really just have to do everything right before you even hit the climb. Make sure you're fueling right all day. You just can't mess up even before the run into the climb. That's the Kind of demonstration of how high the level is of the tour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the big show, and everyone has brought their A game, so uh, that's why it's so fast. I mean, is there a sense of anticipation that uh, the podium's within reach? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's a reality, and I think everyone's kind of seeing that. And we kind of, you know, we we batted the idea around even at the, before the tour started up in Val Gardena. You know, we're like, yeah, a podium that's doable you know we can get that and, and now it seems it's it's definitely a possibility but every day something's changing here so we're really yeah we're looking i think at a podium but we're really still doing the day-by-day -day program because that's all you can do out here now is even yesterday someone could have lost the tour just because of you know a stupid wind or a crash or something like that so you're listening to the velo news cycling podcast supported by jaguar so we heard there from Peter Steth. Now, he was very laid back, relaxed, seems to be coping quite well with his first tour after, I think, a difficult first week or so. It, it seems to have settled down into a, 
a, a, a rhythm now that, that that's better for guys like that. And he's, I think, looking forward to the Pyrenees. Although he admitted that he's never actually climbed these mountains. Um, what were your impressions, Andy, of him and also TJ Van Garden? I mean, you, you spoke to him a little bit today. What what, what did you make of his uh, sort of state of mind? I think the team is pretty confident, really. Like uh, TJ has been saying, there was Ace in the Hall is that final time trial. He thinks they can get back at least a minute on the on the little French climbers. Um, so I think they're very confident in terms of uh, you know if they can keep close to Bardet, Pinot, maybe stay ahead of Perot, they have a pretty good shot of finishing third and perhaps even getting ahead of Valverde. Um, but as we all know, that final time trial is not always as decisive as say the, in the first week when everyone's fresh and the specialists have uh, their, their tanks full. And plus, it's quite a hilly course. I mean, I haven't actually seen the course, but it's not just a straight power course. Stand up for the French climbers, Daniel. <laughs> no, I, I think Hoodie's dead right. I think um, Van Garderen will probably take time on particularly Bardet. I expect Pino to be a bit stronger, obviously depending on what happens between now and then, um, how many bullets they, they all use up. Um, and, yeah, I, I see Van Garderen really threatening them and, and their position on GC at the moment. And you know, perhaps second... That's quite a bold statement, Hoodie, Van Garderen to finish second, but um, I, I think he's certainly got a chance of that. And Valverde, I mean, Valverde talked today in his press conference about feeling better than he had at the start of the race and really kind of um, growing into this tour. Um, I, I still think that he will have something to say in the Pyrenees and his team as well. I mean, Unzue, the Movistar manager, talked about that today, about how um, the team, ev- pretty much everyone on that team feels good at the moment. Um, they haven't really got any major physical problems, which is um, unusual at the moment in the tour. Most of the teams are nursing illnesses or injuries, but Movistar are pretty much at full strength. Well, I tipped TJ Van Garderen to finish third overall in last year's tour in our preview podcast thir- nearly 13 months ago now, so not bad to be only a year out. <laughs> Valver- Valverde, though, I mean, he uh, he was tailed off uh, on the climb to Rizul on Sunday in the Alps. He, he seemed to seem to crack on that climb is is he going to come good in the Pyrenees because it seemed there that he was sort of at his limit and when the and the pressure was really on those those French climbers did take a little bit of time out of him yeah I mean I agree with what Daniel said I mean the, the they've been planning to be hit their peak at, at the Pyrenees all season I mean Valverde didn't race the Dauphiné or Tour de Suisse with the idea of kind of coming in riding into foreman of this tour you know if that's possible these days and then carrying that strength into the Welta and the Worlds where he went to uh try to win another medal so I think that uh, I mean it will be a lot for uh, say Van Garderen to try to get ahead of uh, Valverde he's also the Spanish uh, national time trial champion so he's not a total slack in the, against, the, against the clock what do you think Matt? Well, I think metronomic TJ um, you know I, the Pyrenees would be much tougher than the Alps but I think that, that like we said that final time trial certainly suits him I mean I think he'll do a really good performance there will it be good enough to ride in a second overall you know I'm, I'm definitely not sure uh, I don't. I wouldn't expect to see fireworks from TJ and BMC in the Pyrenees. Certainly not. I think it's more, it's more of racing to limit losses to guys like the like, like the French guys. Mike, you described him then as as metronomic, but there have been a lot of ups and downs in his career. I mean, um, he turned pro when was it? 2011 with HTC um, or 2010? Um, 2010. And um, you know, there've been these flashes of of real promise and that have suggested that he was going to be a future Grand Tour winner and then he's had a whole seasons almost where you've sort of had to revise that assessment. Um, what do you put that down to? That he, he has been slightly inconsistent until now. Well, when I said metronomic, I, I meant sort of in the terms of his physiological makeup. I mean, he's much much better suited to put out a high threshold and not respond to it. So spikes, but so that was in a, in a I guess an acute sense, but in a broader sense of what, what you were talking about, I mean, I, I guess it's hard to know exactly. I mean, you look at the, the 2012 tour, he had, a, he had a good, solid tour. He rode to fifth, he won the white jersey, and he was, you know, he never had a terrible day. Um, and then you look at last year, he had that absolutely terrible day in the Pyrenees, and it was over from the start. So I, I don't know what I would attribute that to. I mean, it, it's, it'd be easy to say youth, you know? I mean, but beyond that, I mean, I'm, I'm just not sure. I mean, I guess he's up and down but I think I think in the third week here he'll be he'll be pretty good uh, he, sorry Richard I was just going to say uh, on the Col d'Isoire on the descent yeah. on the descent of the Col d'Isoire he got distance a little uh, bit and he had to he relied on his teammates to get him back into position but um, and then he 
put a comment on Twitter saying you know, I won't make that mistake again. It did did seem that you know he's obviously got good legs um, because of the work that he did on the front on the on the final climb up to Rissoul, but it just a moment's kind of inattention almost caught him out, and it was quite sort of ironic really that you know skinny little AG two R riders were putting him in difficulty. Uh, absolutely, I mean it's you have to be at the absolute pinnacle of attention especially coming over a climb like that with the senders as good as Nibali on the front it can just fly off the front at any minute and if he wasn't paying attention then you certainly can get caught out I mean fortunately he has a, a strong team not not in a great climbing sense but you know they can put out good power for good periods of time and they could I think that you know they're a bit underrated in this tour um, and, and I guess we'll we'll see in the next two three days what, what they're really made of. Can you tell us a little bit more about the personality behind the the man behind the mask, the Van Garderen mask? Because he's not he's certainly not got a, a profile anything like say Taylor Finney or even Andrew Talansky. Um and yet he's a very solid writer. I think solid is the word, isn't it? Um, he's he's a sort of is he somebody that the American cycling fans is he somebody they they can and will get excited by and I interviewed him in 2010 at the Vuelta which he was riding his first Grand Tour and I found him quite an engaging guy, he had this lovely story about having gone to meet Greg LeMond as a kid with the Greg LeMond complete book of cycling or something and getting him to sign it, you know there was there was, you know he's got heart, he's, he's clearly quite passionate about his sport but he does seem to sort of fly below the radar a little bit in terms of profile and publicity I think he's, he struggled a little bit with having that attention and that media attention on him. Even he said at the beginning of his tour, uh, last year he actually turned off his Twitter account because he didn't like some of that negative feedback he was getting from some of just the Twitterati. Um, but he, he, he's one of these freaks of, of the bike. I mean, he won like 13 or 11 junior national championships. He's been good on a bike since he's 12 years old. His dad was a big cyclist from Colorado. Um, but I think he's growing into that role. I mean, he's used to being, like he said, even today, he goes, yeah, I've been a, a team captain for the last couple of years anyway. This is my first time really leading the tour. He's comfortable in that role. I think he'll grow more into being more of perhaps of a public figure. I think that, has, that doesn't come to him naturally like a guy like Taylor Finney. You know, who is just like a, the class clown or, you know, he's, a, he's the rock star. Whereas, uh, you know, TJ was kind of used to letting his legs do the talking and, and doesn't really like that kind of media focus or that public attention on him. And in fact, he even said today, because what the media says and writes about me doesn't really affect anything in the race. Clearly affect, <laughs> it clearly affects him, though. I mean, uh, Peter Stettina also... <laughs> Andy, do you feel do you feel so sort of undermined by that like claim? That. You like to think that everything that you write is being 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 read by uh, by TJ and the others. Well, I'm they, sure it is. I'm they, sure. They read our stuff. I mean, who knows? I mean, who knows if TJ is reading anything? Because if I was racing in the race, I wouldn't read anything. Actually, to tell the truth, but I know all the sport directors said they do, and they're always reminding us of what we get right or wrong in our stories just about every day. It's always right. Though. Some sports directors even listen to podcasts. <laughs> do they <laughs> really? Fancy that? Do. It's not bad. So I've heard. Ooh. Team, well, prin- team it, principles. It's, it's, e- <laughs> it's better. Uh, it's easier than reading. Right? It is easier than reading, and, th- and this this talking bit is easier than writing as well, isn't it? If you're going to read, easier. if you're going to read I mean, two writers at the Tour de France, so Matt Bowden, Andy Hood, Velo News, the dream team, as I said, the dream team. We're just pod- we're just talking. We're just chatting. We're just chatting our way through this tour. It's great fun. I think to, to what you asked about TJ, do people engage with him like they might engage with another rider? I mean, uh, and maybe this answers the question, but like my short answer is I, I don't know. I mean, I have had a good, I had a great chat with him. I remember in uh, in the in Oman this year, the tour of Oman, and, and and I asked him a bunch of questions, and you know, he gave a bunch of great, thoughtful, what I thought were, you know, because because we're always judging, right? But what I thought were solid and genuine answers, and and. and so I, I had seen in him there sort of a relaxation that, that doesn't exist this race, and certainly you can't fault a guy for that. But I remember last year on the top of Alpe d'Huez, and everybody probably remembers he was in the breakaway that day, and he was, it, was, it was the double Alpe d'Huez stage, and he descended the Col de Seren, and he had, that, he had a mechanical. Um, and then he was on the, on the second climb of Alpe d'Huez, and it looked like he was going to win the stage. And then he suffered a, a pretty bad crack, and you know, he didn't win the stage. He got to the top, and he was, you know, and he was really emotional, and, and understandably so. But I think, I think uh, a guy like TJ, just because he's not saying it, doesn't mean he's not feeling it. Feeling it. And that's, you know, that's, that's just a ridiculous amount of conjecture. 
on my part. That, that was an incredible stage. It was yeah. Christophe Riblon, of course. I wonder if he gets flashbacks when he sees the, the brown shorts of uh, AJ2. Maybe, maybe you should ask him tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not going to ask him. <laughs> now he's surrounded by br- the brown shorts of AJ2. I wonder if he gets flashbacks to that awful moment when when Reblon came past him because it, I mean he was he was heading for the stage win and Reblon just clawed him back and clawed him back and you said he was emotional at the summit was he I didn't actually see him at the summit yeah, I mean, was he, he quite was, emotional he was angry he was angry you mm-hmm. know and I think he suffers from uh, what would I guess could only be considered as sort of this this great American expectation right because Americans don't necessarily care about anybody other than winners uh, I say that in a general sense but what brought Americans to bike racing? Most Americans, and you know, people might some people might think it's ridiculous, but it's, but it's flat not. Is was Lance Armstrong? I mean, so that's what they care about. That's what they expect to see. And so you know, I thought it was Andy Hood that brought brought most <laughs> Americans to bike racing. I mean, Hoodie's been doing this for what twenty years now. Seven years, yeah. pioneer. At our at, at our best, we can hope to be, but a conduit, right? And Hoodie, you're a hell of a conduit. Well, I think I think you have to say, you know, the generation before that, before your time, you know. Le Mans was the first wave, Armstrong was the second, and what we're seeing now are these kind of third wave guys coming through with this new generation of Americans, which, you know, they're, they're riding in a different time and place than, than those previous two generations did, and I think it's, I think the fans that were turned on by the tour through Le Mans into Armstrong, I mean, they love the tour, it's not just a specific, you know, uh, rider and nation, so I think the riders today have that kind of base that those other guys didn't obviously have. Yeah, my, my imp- I mean, my impressions of Van Garden are, are very positive, that he's a hard-working, very humble, down-to-earth guy who does probably deserve the sport. He's not as brash, not as not as colourful, not as uh, flamboyant as, as certain others, but he, he is a solid, hard-working guy who does deserve, I think, people's support. And uh, it's worth adding as well that when I did that interview with him in 2010, I, you know, doping was, was high on the agenda and he spoke about that um, very, very openly and very eloquently and intelligently and very well. You're listening to the Velo News Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. The third Velo News Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. I'm Richard Moore, I'm with Lionel Burney, Daniel Freib, Andy Hood and Matt Bowden. And Matt, Matt has expressed the desire to talk about the cruelty of the sport. I suppose we had that last week uh, with Andrew Talansky and his uh, his um, sad exit. Really, he struggled on finished stage wherever it was. I can't remember now where that was. Oh, yeah. that, oh, yeah. Anybody remember where that was? Oh, yeah. I don't even know. Oyanax. 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 Um, anyway, that was he's he's gone now. He's he's part of the the tour history. Um, a lot of expectations around him, but but we'll have to wait for another year. And um, on Sunday we had Jack Bauer. Uh, suffering a terrible. I think you're keen to talk about this, Matt. You were quite affected by Jack Bar, the Garmin, <laughs> the Garmin Sharp rider, the New Zealander who was away for 222 kilometres Matt, almost. Matt has been really badly affected by this. I've seen him in the press room the last 24 hours. Really? I wasn't in the. Pre- I didn't go to the press room the last 24 hours. <laughs> You've seen my ghost or somebody like me. What were you saying about 24 hours? Oh, can we just can we just talk about heartbreak for a minute, right? Right. Let's just we all know about let's that. just talk <laughs> <laughs> because because you, you think once a guy again, once again this podcast is, is veering into territory that a cycling <laughs> podcast really yeah. should tell us all about heartbreak. Oh, because you see a guy who's out there in the wind and the rain with just just one other compatriot for for 220 k's, and you think that maybe that maybe this could be, that maybe it could stay, that maybe Icarus has not flown too close to the sun this time, Daniel, and that maybe we all have a reason to hope in things that shouldn't really happen. And yet, he's caught on the line, and and the wolves of the peloton eat the deer of the breakaway yet again, and it just crushes us. I, 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 just, I love it when we're joined okay. by the Americans yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. It just crushes us, right? And... Uh, and I just like, oh man, you just, uh, Daniel didn't want to talk about this, but I brought it up because I do. And you just think that, oh, you know, 20 years from now, no one's going to remember that Jack Bauer finished really? second like this. Really? They, I, I, I would bad. argue they would, I would yeah. argue they would almost, they would almost remember it more than they would if he'd won the stage. I believe you just said that you would not remember who you almost won a stage. I believe you just said that. I believe I did not that. say that. I did not. And the thing is, we need, we need the actors and the great play, right? <laughs> because, because they give us the, des- the winners. So if everybody just laid down and did the expected thing all day and was like, oh, we're not going to fight this out, I mean, then, then yeah. we would get these, these it, ridiculous it, foregone conclusions of bike races. I mean, yeah, I mean 
Jack Bauer is clearly a very strong rider. You know, they did incredibly well, him and Martin Elmiger, to hold off the, 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 the rampaging bunch of the last 20 kilometres. It reminded me a bit of um, David Miller's stage win in 2012, where, again, Garmin Sharp had had their, their wings clipped there. Um, they lost their leaders then as well in the big crash on the way into Metz that year when they lost rider Heshedal, Tom Danielson. And they had a lot of freedom to do things that they wouldn't otherwise have had. And, and similarly, Jack Bauer, this is probably the first and only chance in his second tour to get into a breakaway like that. And it almost, you know, it almost his success rate was almost 100% because um, he's never been in a breakaway in the tour. And there he almost won the stage. I remember also last year with Jack Bauer that he had a terrible crash, landed on his yeah. face. And, um, and he appeared in Paris for the end of tour party his face was a was a mess it was on the glandon right it was on the called the glandon yeah yeah and um and he and he i think he could only he could only he couldn't eat could he could only drink he he was drinking through a straw still in in paris and he turned up there to to basically drink champagne through a straw straw. and he was he he was looking forward to the fact that uh, that would get him drunk pretty quickly on the the last night of the tour i just want to agree with matt and say something about these these stories that we get now in the tour and without wanting to criticize lance armstrong because it's not his fault but during those years um, that Lance Armstrong dominated the tour, the, the narrative of the tour became so totally about the yellow jersey and the race for the yellow jersey. And I remember the kind of almost uh, sending it out on loan to somebody and then calling it back in when he wanted it. And the, these, these kind of um, the stage winners stories became a little bit overlooked certainly my perception being part of the English speaking media although not American and I just think that it's great that the tour has got these kind of stories back now and that Jack Bowers you know near miss will become kind of mytholi- mythologized in, uh, in in years to come I'd agree with that Lionel um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask I wanted to ask our American friends a different question um, about Garmin Sharp they, we've talked a lot about Plan Bs in this Tour de France, particularly in relation to Sky. Um, would you agree that um, going into the Tour with Talonski, with pretty much everything behind Talonski, and we're talking about Garmin Sharp here, was slightly risky, um, and that Garmin Sharp are paying for that now? I mean, was it any riskier than their their tour plan of the past couple of tours, which was just to bring up some stage hunters and sort of cause mayhem? I mean... I think that was it was the first year they really committed to a GC guy since since when I mean Hood's going to have to to speak to that exactly but to me it's like they 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 backed a horse didn't work out and and now they're sort of having to um, having to respond to that but I don't think it's much different than Sky I mean they had a strict plan A and then you, you're seeing that now and I think that ultimately Sky will have a more disappointing Tour de France than than Garmin Sharp yeah I think Garmin actually the last couple this is a different uh, shift in their strategy. Because they did just build the whole team around Talansky as kind of like this is the first year of what they said with many trying to get Talansky onto the podium. Because in the past they did kind of bring two or three darts to throw at the dartboard. This was Dan Martin or Ryder Hedgedal. You know, Wiggins was with those guys. Tom Danielson, Vanderbilt. They all kind of popped into the top five. One every year just kind of popped out of nowhere. And next year was somebody else. So this is really the first time they actually did bring a team just built around one guy. So it was new for the team. And you're right, Daniel. I mean, it might have been a risk because now they don't, they don't have much left over. But and Hoodie exacerbated by the fact that they were largely an inexperienced guys. I mean, Slagged has never won a stage in the tour. You know, they picked Ben King, Alex Howes, who all potentially could have done a great job for Talonski. But there was no one. You know, you say that it was similar to last year, but last year they had multiple tour stage wins. Had, you know, I don't know if it's the Brisky Road last year, but you know they had guys like Miller and. Um, they brought a very young team, very inexperienced team, yeah. And I think it's part of part of their program to, to build a team for the future. And also I think that perhaps the team's going in a different direction for the future and they didn't want to bring those older guys to the tour. You're listening to the Velo News Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Okay, we're still here in the beautiful city of uh, Carcassonne with still. its attractions and distractions sitting out here on the street drinking some beers and it's very very pleasant indeed we're going to go for Castle in Carcassonne's number one Castle restaurant quite soon before we do uh, somebody I think it was Andy Hood brought up the fact that we have we're quite well into this podcast now and haven't mentioned Vincenzo Nibali the, the guy who's leading it uh, Andy you've got some things to say about Vincenzo Nibali I just think it's impressive the kind of tour that he's having, absolutely flawless, really. I mean, I mean, Daniel, you probably know him a little bit better than I do because you speak the Italian with uh, Vincenzo. 
but he, he, he seems like he's been breathing through a straw this entire tour. Hasn't been seriously challenged by anyone. You know, rampaged across the, uh, the cobblestones and has just completely smashed everyone in the mountains and absolutely leaving no doubt who deserves to win this Tour de France. And I think that's you know, a story that's been kind of overlooked in the sense everyone's saying, well, you know, Contador's not here, uh, Froome's not here, Port flamed out. But, I mean, Libre has just been impeccable, really. I mean, I mean, pretty much what he said. Mats more comfortable speaking about the Americans. You make a, you make a strong case. Uh, he, I think we we could say a lot here. We could say Nibali looks incredible. He's flying. He looks amazing on the climbs. I mean, and all those things are true. Um, I think he looks a lot better than he is in relation to the sport's absolute best climbers right now. So I think you're, what you're what you're internalizing as seeing as a transcendent Nibali is really just a very 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 good Nibali that would be. You know, was he dropping? Would he drop Contador? Would he drop Froome? I don't think so. Um, but of course, we don't know. Of course, he, he was. Good. He, I think he would win this Tour de France regardless. He wouldn't be. I don't think he would be riding alone at the front anyway. So clearly, the best man is going to win the Tour. Um, but I don't think what we're seeing is a is an honest comparison to the the best bikers in the world. We'll probably go back to, and I was talking about this with you today, Matt, because I think you're working a story on the cobbled stage for. Uh, Sorry, am I giving the game away there? Yeah, no, but no. I think we'll go back to that stage, stage five. And, uh, you know, even as we head into the Pyrenees, half of over half of his overall lead was built on that day. And, yeah, we have been deprived of this fascinating battle that no doubt would have taken place as Contador and Froome tried to nibble away at that two and a half minutes that he claimed. And the way he is climbing, the way he's riding, you wonder if they would have... It would have been close. What do you think, Daniel? I, I don't know. I think in the past we've been very scathing of these sort of estimates of, of power output and, and wattages and, and so forth. But Hang on, I didn't mention power output. No, 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 no but I, I think that they do tell us a lot, and or um, well, they can tell us a lot. And in this case, in this tour, the figures that I've seen suggest that Nibali, um, his performances have not been that extraordinary. And he probably, he probably would have struggled. What's going on there? I think um, someone's storming the gates. Yeah. yeah. He, um, I think he would have struggled against the Froom. What the f- <laughs> my word! <laughs> what on earth? Who let the, the dogs out? Well. Um, anyway, um, he would have struggled against the Froom that we saw last year. Um, yeah, I've been getting a lot of. I don't know exaggerate. I don't know exaggerate how sort of um, how active I am on Twitter or how active people are in replying to me. But I've been getting quite a few messages over the last few days about. You know, his, sure. no, his performance is being unbelievable um, and defying you know, any kind of logic. But I, I just don't see this. You know, for me, Nibali's performances have been completely in line with the rest of his career so far, and the natural progression of someone who is now 29, um, and and completely also in line with the competition he's facing. You know, like we made the point a couple of nights ago about. Jean-Christophe Perrault was stuck with him all the way to Rizal. Um I just don't see anything extraordinary about it whatsoever. No, I think, sorry Richard, again, cutting oh, in a, a, over you there. Like, you know, but uh, the, I think the thing is that um, the person who wins the tour is, becomes the lightning rod for all of the, the questions and suspicion. But when you actually break down what, what uh, Nibali has done, he managed to catch up to Raphael Maika and Leopold Koenig on the stage to Shamrus and drop them and leave them for 10 seconds. And those guys have been out there for, you know, a long time. Um, and really, Nibali's strength has been how smart he's ridden. He, he, is, he is winning the tour by taking, as Richard says, these Nibali-sized bu- chunks of, uh, of time when he knows he's strong. And, he, and he's, he's doing it quite methodically, cleverly. He's not stretching himself. He knows that there's probably these three tough stages in the Pyrenees to come. He's, hey, I don't get the feeling that he's extended himself into the red at all. It's also a reflection of the field that he's racing against. He doesn't have to go further. I think he could go further. I think, yeah. and, 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 right. Yeah. And, and as the Belgians say so well, if my uncle had tits, she'd be my aunt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. You, have to, you, have to, you have to judge things based on what is here. The Froome and Contador are out of the race. And it doesn't matter. We can just talk all day. It's like, yeah, maybe Nibali would get dropped by those guys. But I don't think Nibali's been pushed to his limit yet. Yeah, you know, I've had messages to the... Sorry, Matt. Sorry, Matt was desperate to jump in there. I've had messages to the effect that it's impossible for Nibali to progress as much as he has since the Dauphiné. Well, you know, that was six weeks ago now. And, um, you know, realistically, if Nibali... Let's say Nibali was doping. He hasn't started doping in the last six weeks. He's probably... You know, when have you ever read a rider's memoir... 
where he said, you know, I, I started doping sort of six weeks before a Tour de France that I really needed to win. It doesn't happen like that. If he's cheating, he's been cheating probably since the, since the word go. Um, so I just don't don't see that as a feasible hypothesis. But as as you've said in our other Telegraph cycling podcast, supported by Jaguar, Daniel, yeah, sorry. Uh, that his career trajectory has been consistent, steady, and you know, I mean, I. I'm kind of loath to go down this road of yeah. um, this this sort of m- quite meaningless speculation, really. Also, as Andy says, in terms of the the whole power output part, the wattages debate hasn't really ha- happened this year. There hasn't there haven't been seemed to be so much attention on that, which perhaps could I be think because the numbers are actually within the parameters of what. Is people but, think is fairly normal. Yeah, but I mean, I think Nibali's done what he's had to do, and and as Andy says, I think if Contador and Froome had been in the race, we'd have probably seen better numbers from Nibali because he'd have had to push himself a bit harder. So I, I, I mean, I, I don't. We've had this discussion before, but I, I don't really. And I, I know Matt has. We've had discussion with Matt as well that I, I don't, I don't buy this X figure equals suspicion. I, I just don't see any red flags. I don't see. Um, any specific red flags either in his performances or anything he said in press conferences and also you know people will talk about the association with Vinokurov and Martinelli who was um, Pantani's director sportive I mean it's either naive or it's I think it's intellectually dishonest to suggest that director sportifs now are actively involved in teams doping programs we haven't seen that for years you know the last documented case of a director sportif having some influence in a doping program was probably Johan Brunier with Lance Armstrong um, so that is not how cycling works now. If someone is cheating, they are not, you know, they are not taking advice from their direct support team. So Martinelli being there, Vinokurov being there, to me, it's kind of meaningless. I think suspicions lower at this tour too because we haven't had that visceral sort of moment, which was Froome absolutely annihilating Alberto Contador on the Vontu last year that sort of forced us all to stand there and say, is that exceptional? Is it surreal? What, what are we looking at? Um, this year it's been, I think it's been, you know, much more um, subdued. But, um, sorry to, to come back in there. Again, 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 again. again. We, uh, it's an argument I've made time and time and time and time and time and time and time, and time again. Um, the... Uh, Nibali's performance on the cobbles was exceptional. Nobody equated that to doping. We watch this sport, we watch any elite sport, to see exceptional performances. Guys at this level should be, the the guys who win should be producing exceptional performance. That's the whole point, isn't it? Um, And so I don't, again, looking back at Froome last year, I don't look at his performance on Von 2, and that doesn't, for me raise a red flag to use Daniel's especially purely on the basis of how it looked I just don't buy that at all but we've had this discussion time and time again and we're going to carry on having it aren't I, was we? Interested. I was speaking to Sebastian Weber the Cannondale coach today who's Peter Sagan's coach who we'll hear from in the Telegraph podcast tomorrow but he was talking about how it's, it's, it's almost strange that the focus has fallen on the general classification riders and the power output um, that they're capable of and, and not and there's been no attention whatsoever on what the sprinters are putting out you know and if, if, if it could be that Marcel Kittel is putting out 2,500 watts which is a you know according to conventional wisdom is an impossible figure but no one is is um is interested in that no one is debating that I don't think that is the case but it's, it's harder to calculate yeah, isn't yeah, it yeah, that, that's the yeah. that's the bottom line I mean the claims are relatively easy not that easy but relatively easy to to arrive at a figure and so you know again for the cobble stage you know what what was Nibali putting out there it was an, an amazingly impressive performance well yeah absolutely I mean to put out to, to ride like that a little skinny climber guy to ride like that on the cobbles that's the outstanding performance of, of not th- just this tour but the, the last two or three tours but it would to skill you know yeah, and, and you see that again absolutely. also with the, the, the cl- on the climbs there's, there's, a, there's a, like an equation it's power to weight whereas if you're a sprinter or a cobbled rider you can see that there's an awful lot of skill and bike handling ability and all the rest of it involved I would argue that's the case for any discipline within cycling should we should we finish up there (laughs) Daniel's quite adamant about that we're all getting hungry I think well we're gonna we're gonna be back for one more Velo News cycling podcast uh, before the end of the tour we'll wrap things up with Matt and Andy again but Matt thank you very much again for joining us thanks for having me 
Andy, thank you. Thank you very much, and merci beaucoup. Daniel. It's been like a transatlantic odyssey. This has been a real insight into a different world for me. <laughs> <laughs> Lionel. Can we have some cassoulet now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for listening. You're listening to the Velo News Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar.